Welcome everybody to the new semester and to lecture one at databases and information systems and also information retrieval. We will talk a little bit about this in a minute. So it's uh, two lectures. It's the information retrieval lecture, but it also counts at that one. You can also only take it as either of the two, obviously, not as both at the same time. So today it will be a half of the lecture will be about organizational stuff uh, and you can also ask questions of course but there will also be some contents already and that's uh, I don't know if people are here have taken the information retrieval course I have a poll in the second this will look familiar because we will start with building a very simple search engine that's a part of information systems and uh, the exercise sheet will be to implement that search engine. We will start it to, together today and then you will implement it in the exercise sheet. So let me maybe just for starters three demos of for the kinds about the kinds of things we will see in this course. So let's see my first demo is uh, and it's all stuff which is somehow related so made in Freiburg or made by you. This is uh, DBLP that's a computer science uh, bibliography where you can just uh, search something and then you get results like publications, authors, uh, conferences with that name. So here I typed uh, databases or I could type information retrieval. So this is work done by us a long time ago, but it's still, and I just wanted to show you there's actually, I can log in here on that machine. Let's just see, and if I look at the log. So right now it's, it's used a lot. This uh, is like one of the most important sites for searching publications. So actually if, we, if I search something here, I should... Is it there? Let's search something uh, new. Let's search databases again. Oh, now it's... Uh, uh, let's maybe search something. Oh yeah, there it was, you see? So it's a, it's a live engine used by, uh, and you see it's very fast, you see everything is milliseconds here. So that's when you build a search engine. People can type something all over the world, they get results, you operate the server. That's demo number one. So this is how we will start building something like this, traditional search engine made in Freiburg. Wikidata, who in the room knows Wikidata? We will talk more about Wikidata. Wikidata, sister project of Wikipedia. Wikidata, nobody, not a single person in the room. Okay, hmm, interesting. That's uh, fewer than usual, by the way. Okay, Wikidata, let's just... Uh, so Wikidata is the structured part of uh, Wikipedia. So for example, let's type uh, Uni Freiburg here. Yeah, University of Freiburg. Now I get, that's not a Wikipedia page, it's all the structured data, triples. We will talk about that in a few lectures. So it's like what you have in the info boxes. Uh, on Wikipedia, also on Google, and you saw here, if I type something, I get a list of entities for which I have pages. If I make a mistake, it doesn't work, no match found. That's actually, uh, there will be an exercise about this, exercises six and seven, where you will make this better, and you will be able to do this. Here's another demo about knowledge graphs. Let me just uh, show you this. I need a first name, please. So this is now Wikidata, and you can search in all the structured data from the Wikimedia project. 19 billion facts. And I need a first name, please, from the room. A not so common and not so rare first name, so that it's interesting. Any first name? Olaf. Olaf. Okay, why not? Let's take Olaf and see whether... Olaf, there we have Olaf, with F or with V? F. F, the real Olaf, okay. So now we get, so Wikidata knows 561 people named Olaf, and here it shows us their birthplaces, and we can look at this on a map. So Olaf, yeah, it's a 
Okay, maybe let's also try the other Olaf because we also saw it there. But what would we expect for the other Olaf? Okay, there, there it is. Okay, there are fewer ones of the... Okay, so the one with the V, you see it's more popular in other areas. So this is also something made by us and you will also learn how this works in principle. And then we will also, it's the lecture about database and information systems, also information retrieval, large language models. We will talk about more about learning stuff in the end. This is... Uh, OpenAI, ChatGPT, has anybody heard about this in the room? <laughs> okay, you're laughing. I just asked ChatGPT the same question. I want the coordinates of all Perth places of people in Wikidata with first name. Olaf, just the Sparkle query, please, important and some uh, professional advice here. Let's see what it does. Certainly, <laughs> if you like to, and here comes the Sparkle query. So how does that work? So magically, not only can it answer everything, it can also give me a Sparkle query. And let's just see if it works. So it knows Sparkle, it writes a query, it understood my question. This is the query it came up with. Let me execute it. Okay. Apparently not the best query. Mm -hmm. Something, uh, oh, I have an idea why. Yeah, it's not quite uh, correct, I think. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I always do this live, so always something else uh, happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do I do this, please? Uh, Last two triples don't look good in the query. Please use, um, I don't know, strf starts maybe. So you can talk to this thing. Let's just see. Here's a mod. Okay, always willing to please. So that's a SQL like query here where you, okay, now it's. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see if that works. If it doesn't work, we just move on. Oh, that one works. Now I get the Olaf's. Yeah, same result via ChatGPT. Okay, not bad. Not yet made in Freiburg, but we are working on it. So, what are the research topics? And this is also an overview of what we will learn in this uh, course. So, you saw this very first engine that was uh, 10 million or so. Uh, records, <laughs> you need to do something, you need some pre-computation so that it's fast, everything you saw was pretty fast. Ranking is important, you search something, you get a lot of results, you want the most relevant ones first. Database stuff, knowledge graph stuff, this is what you have seen, uh, wiki data, structured data, we will talk about that pretty soon in this lecture. This was when you typed in Wikidata, maybe you mistype, you want to find entities from a list, you still want to find it when you make a typing mistake. Everything we have seen had a web app, everything had a, right, when you go to Google, it's a, it's, it's a part of information systems to have some front end, so we will learn about that. Although some people always dispute whether that's part of <laughs> this topic. And I very much think it's part of that topic. Every information system has a web interface. And then in the second part of the lecture, we will move to the wonderful world of linear algebra. So we will say, explain how most of the things you have seen here, you can also cast it as matrices and vectors. So quantum physics also does that. Everything, the whole world, physics, the universe, and also artificial intelligence database and uh, information systems is just matrices and vectors and it's very magical and that will be the second part of the, of the course. So that's a rough overview and maybe now is the time to launch this uh, poll where I will ask two questions and uh, let's just see, are you getting it? Do you have uh, you get the question? 
And the question is just have you, I mean, while you are answering, let me just explain a few things. So for reasons I'm not going into, the databases and information systems course will be held by me every two years now and then some another colleague, but this year I'm doing it. But we are also doing the information retrieval lecture and this counts as both, either this one or that one. Uh, it's your choice. You don't even have to make that choice now unless you have already heard one of the lectures, but that's why, that's what I'm, I'm wanting to check here because this lecture is completely different to the database and information systems lecture so far. So if you have heard that in the past, you can hear that again and just you should get credits for information retrieval then, I guess, because it's just a different course. But it's very similar to the information retrieval lecture. It's not the same. I wouldn't, maybe not very similar, but similar. Yeah, I think it's very similar. So this probably doesn't work. If you have heard information retrieval before. <coughs> okay, it's stabilizing. Let me just show. You should see the results now. Okay, so yeah, there are a number of people who have heard that before. Okay, now I didn't ask whether why you are here, whether you want to hear it again or you didn't pass or you just think it's new. But we also have uh, 14 people who have heard information retrieval before. So I don't know, I don't think, this is very similar then. I, I don't have a decision for you now. Maybe you just stay for today, but if you have heard it before, you will recognize the first lecture. It's very similar to the first lecture from previous years. You're welcome to stay, but I don't know whether you can really take that again and because it's so similar. Okay, but we have this result now, thank you. So let me just move on. Or is there, apart from this aspects which I just named, any other questions about this information retrieval databases two in one thing? Or is what I just said clear enough? I also already wrote a post on the forum. Anyway, if you have questions, we are sitting here for longer time. So first part, very quickly about organization and style. So today we started at a normal time. In the future, we will start early and go a little bit later, just so that we have enough time so that we can make breaks, one or two. It just proved to be a good idea. It's never a good idea to rush in a lecture. And if you really have a problem, to come at this time. The first part is always a little bit of organizational stuff, talking about the last sheet. So if really you can only come at 14, 15, that still works. The contents will only start then. If you absolutely have to leave early, there will be a recording and everything. So, but I think for most people, that's not a problem. There are 13 lectures altogether, but we have 15 slots because we have no fire target this semester. But anyway, we will skip them. We will just create our personal holidays, which is a good idea for a number of reasons. 13 lectures is enough. For one semester, we have some buffer then if something happens. And also, we always go a little bit over time, which is just good not to rush, have a little more time. And this just compensates for this. I think that's a good deal. Alternative would be to have another date in the week where we have a second lecture, but nobody wants so many appointments. So all lectures are recorded and live streamed right now. What if we sign up for both exams in the chat? You can't sign up for both exams. Or maybe you can, but something terrible will happen. But you shouldn't for obvious reasons. You can't get credits for two courses by listening to one. I think that's obvious. We have a our estimated video editor is doing a great job. Our videos are produced quite professionally. Alexander does this. All the course material is on the wiki. I've shown you briefly the wiki page. It's here. It's also on the first exercise sheet. Uh, the link here. Yeah. So just so that you have seen this page. Once you have seen it, you will recognize it when you see it again. Everything is on there linked and also we use a subversion 
I will talk about more about that at the end of the lecture, so that everything is also in this repository and you always get the newest material by just saying update, give me everything, right? Uh, that's on our server. A re such a versioning system is just everything is on our server, also the stuff you submit for the exercise sheet, you can upload it there, you get the newest stuff from us and getting the newest stuff is just typing SVN update in the command line. Oh, oh, by the way, now that I think of this, many of you are probably using Windows machine. I also have Windows on my laptop. SVN is actually has a very nice Windows front end, which is called Tortoise SVN. Thank you for the ads. Tortoise SVN. So then you just have it in your Explorer window and uh, but you can also use it on the command line. It's a simple versioning tool and uh, I have a few slides about this in the end. Everything is there except for the recordings because they are big. They will be on the wiki, always in two formats, just watching them on YouTube or you can also download a compress compressed MP4. Thank you, Frank. It was our administrator. Exercise sheets. The exercise sheets are important and now comes, uh, so there's one sheet per lecture, so the lecture and the sheet always go together. Nothing for the last lecture, that will be more, uh, we will talk about the evaluation, outlook, I will present work at our chair, so it's 12 sheets. Deadline is always 12 noon before the next lecture, so two hours before the next lecture start. And this year the exercises are voluntary. This is new. So in the past, you always had to pass 50% of the exercise sheets. We don't do it that way this year. You do not need 50%. You need 0% or larger of the points to get your Studienleistung. And I have it again on another slide. So there's no, you don't have to do the exercise sheet. You can do them. It's of course very nice. They're very nice sheets, but you don't have to. You can also work in groups if you like, but then only one of you should commit solutions. And how exactly we do that, we will tell you. For now, you can just start working and we will provide the details later. Still, if you plagiarize, I mean, people, humans are just strange and even with these rules, some of you will copy stuff, don't do it. It's forbidden and will be punished and pretty severely. So if if somebody copies, we have been doing this for a number of years now, we have been too nice in the past, it just happens so much. If, some, if you copy, it, it doesn't happen by coincidence. You do it on purpose, which means one time is enough and, and there will be consequences. So please don't do it. Now you wonder, why do I even say it? Well, we have tutors which give you feedback, which look at your stuff, and if you get three times the same thing, then three tutors who are paid for this, who spend their precious time on this, spend time to give feedback on three times the same thing, three different people, and that's not okay. So, yeah, it's just mean, and anyway, copying stuff is totally meaningless under these rules, right? So, there's absolutely no reason to do it. Yeah, don't do it. Yes? If we in groups, it doesn't count as plagiarism. Yeah, exactly. So uh, one of us uh, submits the solution and does it count to, to everyone that works in the group? Yeah, it counts to everyone, but I mean, there is no counting because there is no... You will get points just so that you know how well you did. But the final points don't mean anything. They are not necessary to pass anything. There's no requirement on the number of points. But we will still give you points so that you know, oh, this is how well I did, so that you have an idea for the exam. And we will actually be as strict as we are in the exam. So you get a, you get a kind of feeling, okay, with that performance, I will get all points in the exam, I would get no points in the exam, and so on. Okay. But the points are not needed for anything. That's what I meant to write here, and that's new. In the past, you always needed 50% of the points, and this is a negation here. You do not. So now points uh, uh, are not required. Yeah, 
they are not required for anything, but still you get them as a feedback so that you know, okay, this was, I get full points for this. I didn't get, because people are insecure about how is it sufficient what I did. And please ask questions anytime. You can just start talking. There will be no time slots for tutorials. Maybe you saw it on the Hisin one for a good reason. S people always say they want tutorials. We did it in 100 variants already. It's always the same. Only few people come and those who come just sit there. Somehow expecting that something magical happens. They listen. You just don't learn that way. People will write it in the feedback also for this course. It would have been nice if there were tutorials. We just do it, don't do it anymore. It's meaningless. So, some things, this very life is complicated and so many things have two sides. I don't think this has two sides. It just doesn't make sense. There will be no weekly Q&A either. We also did that. It also doesn't make sense. People just come and listen, don't ask questions. It goes in the one ear, comes out of the other. But, of course, we will offer something valuable. I mean, if you submit an exercise sheet and you ask for feedback, you will get feedback and you will get personal feedback. That's very valuable. Somebody, a human being, will look at your sheet and over the weeks will tell you, yeah, here you could improve something, individualized feedback. I think that's very important for learning. It's very important, it's also written on the sheet, that you say what you want. Let me just briefly uh, show that here on the first exercise sheet. It's uh, written here in the end and, uh, and also in our rules. Make sure to add a statement asking for feedback. So you will always submit with your solution for the exercise sheet. We will talk more about that towards the end of the lecture, a text file, so it's just a markdown so that you can add some simple markup there. And you should always add a feedback what you want from the tutor because some people, they are not really interested. They don't want r so much feedback. Others want feedback. Other, some people want feedback only on certain things. And again, to make it meaningful and efficient, just write it in your, here I submitted something, Please, you don't have to say so much about this because I didn't really put effort into this or whatever, but here I would really like to know is this good. So just, uh, yeah, there's a human being on the other side, just tell them what you want, what you need. And if you don't write anything about this, you don't get feedback. A and you maybe wonder why, why this is so strict, but this, uh, I mean, few people in the room, there are 200 people participating and it's just, it's so easy with so many people to generate a lot of meaningless work. So wherever it's weaning, meaningful, we are very happy to put in the effort, but not where it's meaningless and just costs people time. And I can tell you from experience that that happens a lot when you have a large audience. I think it's not so easy for you to understand because each of you is just one individual. You see things from your perspective, but we have you as a group. We have 200 people or so. And so that's why I'm saying all this. And here it is again, you have to write it and it's very easy for you. You spend time on the exercise sheet. Now just write a sentence, what you want. And then, so you basically a negotiation with your, a conversation with your tutor who will be very helpful, of course. There's also a forum that's also important. Some, most of you already saw it when you register on our systems, you can just ask questions. And also, we have that for some time now, because we don't have tutorials, you can make individual appointments. For the first week, we don't do that. This will start next week. We have a tool where you can just book very easy. You don't even have to write an email for those of you who have uh, social phobia or something like this. You can, very important that you have a tool where you can just click and then you get a 10 minute, 20 minute slot or so where you can talk with a human being and uh, ask them questions and you get individual feedback. Style of the lectures, that's also important. So I will provide motivation, basics. We will do live coding together, example, but it's really the basics, the intuition, why are we doing this? And very important, the inspiration. Oh, that's uh, interesting. I want to learn more. 
But that's really all, right? If I, I could give you all the details, I could do mathematical proofs for hours, I love it. There, there are whole YouTube channels uh, about this and they are great, but you don't learn a thing. I can't emphasize this enough. You watch a YouTube channel with someone doing a mathematical proof and I like to watch those too. It's very nice, very entertaining. You don't learn one thing, you just forget it. It's just so important. You only learn stuff when you do it yourself. You just don't learn stuff by listening. But it's important to listen, but then listen as a, okay, ah, that's what it's about. Now I got the intuition, the basic ideas, and I'm really motivated now to go deeper. But that part you have to do, otherwise it doesn't work. We always have one topic per lecture, so it's not just that I talk, at some point I stop talking, then I continue talking, and the next lecture it's always self-contained uh, lectures. That's also why we go a little bit over time in each lecture, because you just need a little more than one and a half hours. That's just what experience shows. After two hours it becomes too much. Somewhere between one and a half and two hours seems to be the sweet spot if you don't want to rush. And rushing is also a problem. These YouTube videos are always so <laughs> very entertaining. You, you can't even think that fast. So, all the materials you need, lectures, slide sheets, everything that you need for the sheets, it's, in the, it's on the slides, except maybe some manual or reference stuff. But it's not that you have to read other books or anything to, uh, to be able to do the sheets or understand the material. There are pointers at the end towards literature if you're interested, but you don't, it's not necessary. Yeah, I added this, so our, I would say, no bullshit approach. So we are very straightforward, honest, and also direct. So we are very nice people, and we invest a lot of work in this course. Criticism should be written with a small c, it's welcome. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's important that you also do your part of the work, right? It, it goes uh, both ways. There are always some people, again, human beings, and they are often the loudest, they do very little and they have a lot to complain about and uh, that's, then we are not so nice to be, yeah, that's, uh, I don't like that. That's also a problem in society, right? It's the people who, they invest little but then they, they somehow disturb the atmosphere, everything is not good, everything should be done this way or that way. So. I think it's very important in a lecture like this and in general in life that it goes both ways. You put in your part of the work and we have different roles here and, and then we are very happy to put in our part of the work and then we are also nice. But we are not always nice <laughs> if you do straight. Yeah. So what you should learn in this course, two kinds of understanding are important. So you should, of course, understand the concepts. So every lecture has some, is about something and you should understand it in depth, not just superficially. But you should also understand how to do things in practice. That's in all my lectures. If you have been in other lectures by, by us before, it's always like this. It's important to understand the, like the theory in depth, but then also apply it in practice. I say that because at the university you often have A and not B. So you understand everything in theory, but you have no idea how to apply it. And in other parts of the world you have a lot of B, you learn, oh, this is how it's done, but you don't really understand what's behind it. So this is very much an A plus B lecture. And I would say both are equally important. <coughs> and also both to the same degree. <coughs> I'm sorry. Master solutions, so after the deadline for each sheet, the master solutions are published. And uh, that's also important only for you, your use now and in the future. So that's also a serious offense to somehow publish them or pass them on to others. <coughs> they are strictly only for, for your use. And again, master solutions 
If you have put in the work and done the sheet, then of course it can be very instructive. Let me just see how they did it. Oh, I see. Oh, could have been done better in that way. What absolutely doesn't make sense is you don't do the exercise sheet. You just look at it and then you look at the master solution. You say, yeah, yeah, that, that's also how I would have done it. Now I, now I understood it. I'm saying that because a lot of people learn that way. They're looking at stuff and then just checking whether it makes sense. And if it makes sense, then they think they have learned it. You don't learn that way. So if you have put in the work your own solution, and then looking at the master solution makes sense. Amount of work, so six ECTS for a long time now, all courses at this faculty have, not all, but almost all have six ECTS, which makes it very easy to have a choice for example, like these two lectures here now. So that's about 180 working hours. Here are three options for the exercise sheet. Option one is zero hours per exercise sheet if you don't do them. That's one option. It didn't used to be an option in the past years because there you need to reach 50% of the point. So that's option A, zero hours. It's not an approximation, it's exact. We did experiments. Option B is you do them. That, of course, depends on your personal knowledge and what experience and how fast your brain is and so on. Eight hours, I think, is a good average time if you do an exercise sheet. By the way, you are welcome to do some exercise sheets and not others. So given the, the system in this course where it's not a requirement, that's totally okay. And you don't have to tell us before. You don't have to say, I'm going to do all the sheets, I'm going to just decide on a sheet-by-sheet -sheet basis, depending on your personal circumstances at that time. This is also important. If you lack basic prerequisites, and this will apply to one-fourth of the people in the room, this will be a lot more work. And let me say something very important. So by basic prerequisites, I mainly mean mathematics. I know from experience and from 30 years teaching experience in computer science that a lot of people have problems with math. And I'm not talking about advanced mathematics. I'm talking about the simplest mathematics. I know that's a problem. That's OK. But you should be aware of it. The same goes for programming. Some people are good at it. Some are just good at it in theory, some have experience. And this makes a big difference for this course. If you have problems here, right? If you have problems with absolute basics, then more advanced stuff just takes you much more time. And here's an important statement, so you don't have to raise your arm who you are, but just so that you know, if that applies to you, you have problems with math or with programming, you're still very welcome to do this course, but you have absolutely be prepared and willing to spend twice the time. This course is well suited in the sense that I will always give little crash courses. Look, maybe you didn't understand this in the past. Here's how it works. It will also help those who have already heard this before, but then if you haven't learned these concepts before, as you should, then you should learn them now. And this will cost additional time and a lot of time. So you should like reserve 16 or 20 hours and, and drop some other lectures. <laughs> I'm just uh, saying this because that's how it is. And it affects a lot of people. So if you're lacking the prerequisites, then you just have to make a choice. Not now, but maybe in one or two weeks. OK, I'm one of these person, people that's OK. Am I willing to invest like 20 hours per week? And then use this to fill my gaps in math understanding or programming. That's OK, but you have to make a decision. What doesn't make sense is to not appreciate that you have these gaps, expect that it takes eight hours or less, and complain. That's, uh, that's happens, and that's not good. That uh, just creates a bad atmosphere on both sides. But you're, you're very welcome. OK, Studienleistung. For, for all the courses, or most of the courses, you have a Prüfungsleistung, the exam in the end. That will be the next slide, and a Studienleistung. So the Studienleistung you basically get for free. You have to register on our, that's on the first exercise sheet, our own course system, and for the, for the exam. Then you get the Studienleistung. This is not urgent yet. 
deadline for this is sometime after Christmas, so you don't have to make up your mind now. So no technical requirements except these two things which you will manage to do. That's what we will talk talked about earlier. You do get points for the sheet because I think when you do a sheet you want to know how well did I do. Right? You don't just want uh, well done or nice that you have submitted something. It's good that you get feedback qualitative feedback, look here, this was not so good, here's something that could be done better, but also quantitative feedback, like you get it in the exam. Here's an important disclaimer. So we have five tutors this time, and it's a new situation because we have information retrieval, people who are interested in that database and information system, and altogether I think it's 300 people, I think 300 will not stay, but maybe 200. So more like a basic, yeah, that's just a lot of people and we can't hire so many tutors. So I expect probably a lot of you will submit for the first sheet, but then it will be some people will submit here, some here. I hope that five tutors, five tutors can correct about 100 submissions, not more. If for some reason you all decide this semester, now that it's voluntary, you all want to submit. When it's requirement, you don't submit. When it's, you never know how human beings work. So then, then we have to see what we do. So if you get 200 submissions every week, we, don't, we have a problem. I don't think it will happen, but let's see. And then we have the exam. Date will be fixed in the second half. I don't know if we have a say in this or if the Prüfungsamt does it, or maybe they will fix it. Ah, it might be that they fix it earlier, I don't know. And it will be four tasks, 25 points. Actually, don't take my word for this, but it's also not important. I mean, the, the point is you get 100 points and then there's just a grading scheme, 50 points is passed. Here you get the 1.0. And just so that you know it before, this exam will test all of the following three. There was this earlier slide, basic understanding. Of course, there will always be simpler questions like, did you understand it at all? There will be deeper understanding, of course, and also practical stuff. You will have to write code also for the exam. And I can tell you right in the beginning, I mean, it's kind of obvious, but just so that it's said, superficial understanding, so just like producing words which somehow have to do something with the topic, just the basics will not be enough to pass the exam. So you need to have a certain level in all three of these because the proportion will also be roughly one-third, one-third, one-third. I mean, it's, it's kind of clear, but I just wanted to say it. And also over the years, we also do our exams that way that we see whether you actually understood something and not just Right? It's a common practice to, if you have a superficial understanding, you just write words which are somehow related to the question, a bit like a bad language model, and then expect to get points. We, we don't do our exams that way. Actually, it's, it's not easy, but it can be done that you ask a question and you only can answer it if, if you understood it. By deeper, I don't mean super deep. So I don't want to instill any fear in you. It's not that you have complicated high IQ questions in the exam, but they're like questions, write down the definition of this or just some very basic questions and questions where it's just, did you really understand it? So it's not super hard questions, but did you understand it? Well, just to be sure, yeah. Oh yeah, so the question was, will anything, any of the points be counted towards the exam? No, it's not even allowed by law. So it's just for you to practice, to get feedback early on, but the final mark will only be the exam and that's also the law. It's not allowed to take points from the exercises or class participation or the exam, that's the, the final grade. Yes, please. Yeah, that, that was the question. You, you came a little bit late maybe because there was this poll in the beginning where I asked this and said this. 
we haven't 100% decided yet. So this is, yeah, where, where do I have this? Can you see it here? Yeah, so there are these 14 people who did here information retrieval. So let me say it again, this lecture is very different from database information systems in the past. That was a classical and a bit old uh, style lecture. Very different from this one, but quite similar to this one. So probably it doesn't make sense, but we are not we have to think about it. We first wanted to know how many people there actually are. So you are one of these 14, right? You heard it before. Yes. So sorry, I can't give you a definite answer. Now we have to think about it. Any other questions about this was the organizational part. We will make a short break now, then go to the contents. With the Klausur, okay, there's another question voluntary because there are not enough tutors. Now there are more reasons for the voluntary, but that was one reason. Will the, will the exam be completely different compared to the database exams of previous years? Completely, yes, completely different because the contents of the course is completely different. So I don't know if we have anybody here, you don't have to say it, who has just has to take the exam again for database information retrieval. I'm sorry, it will be new content. If that's a problem, maybe we can talk. I think it affects only very few people. Since you said that you only do every two years, does this mean I'm just reading questions from the chat, but it's an uh, interesting one. Does it mean that next year will again be the old database lecture material? No. This is the new database and information system, uh, systems lecture and it will be held by me and someone else in turns, but with a very similar material. So maybe Joschka Bödeka will do it next year with these slides or similar slides. But then in the years where I don't give it, I will do an advanced lecture. So in the past I would give information retrieval every year. Now I'm doing this lecture here in uh, uneven years and in the evening years like uh, a follow-up with more advanced stuff because students have always asked about that. Okay, we will have a second half. If you have more uh, questions, let's now make a break for five minutes and reduce the CO2, which is now twice Eocene level, 2400. So five minute break. See you again in five minutes. Okay, let's continue with the content. So, as I said, first lectures about building a simple search engine. Let me just explain. It's, it's very simple, and the exercise is mainly a, okay, a getting used to stuff exercise, programming, understanding something simple, registering. It's just a everything, getting used to everything exercise. So for the first exercise sheet, let me just, uh, so we will now, here we have, that's on a machine, at our, in our rooms here where we'll do the programming. I have two windows here, this one and this one, and one I will write the code, and the others I will compile the code. Okay, I'm here. And uh, let me just show you the data set for the first exercise sheet which is also on the wiki, it's linked on the wiki. Let me show you here if I go back. Yeah, it's a data set sheet for ES1 and it has information about movies over 100,000. And let me just briefly show it to you. It looks like this. So you have movies here, they are ordered by IMDb score, it starts with a Shawshank Redemption, the all times number one, Dark Knight Inception, so it's actually ordered one, two, three, four, five, six. So if you look at the, you can ask yourself how many of the first ten movies have you seen? And I think I actually have a poll about this, do I have? Let me see, yeah, let me just ask this, I think it's still there from back. Let me just launch that top 10. How many have you seen of these movies? So you see the list? There it is. 
How many have you seen of the first ten? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, until Fellowship of the Ring. Okay, that's your data set, so just movie titles with uh, descriptions, rather long descriptions. And while you are taking part in the poll, and now we have a keyword query like Pacino, Maf maybe you're interested in mafia movies with Al Pacino, and that's your keyword query. And for today, I will only explain it for two keywords, for the exercise sheet you do it for any number of uh, keywords, and now we just want all the movie descriptions which contain all of the keywords, so both Pacino and Mafia, anywhere in the description. And for the exercise sheet, you just, just return three documents, any three. If there are 100 hits, just return any three. So we don't do ranking today, like, uh, yeah. You should note, and you can exploit that, that these are already ranked somehow. So if you take the first three from the list, from this list, uh, in this order, you will all get already get some ranking because the input movies are ordered by, by IMDb score. Oh, it's stabilized already. Let's see what the result are. The results are none. Okay, there are two people. Wow. <laughs> Interesting, all 10 of them, believe it or not, 11. Let me just check for myself. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. I'm also 10 out of 10, just so you know. Okay, interesting. I think it's a very important part of uh, education that you have watched these movies. So, so how do we do this uh, keyword search? Given a keyword query, just so there's always, it's always good when you, when you have a research question or a programming question, what's the simplest solution? The simplest solution is just I go over all the documents and let me just do that here and I use like grab. So I could do the following. Let's just see how large is this file. It's not super large, 50 megabytes. It's the first exercise sheet. We will work with larger files in the following. Let me just to a Unix style grab, just finds, give me all lines which contain a certain regular expression. And I could just do, I don't know, I want Pacino, Mafia. Now I have to do a strange thing because this will search for a string Pacino, any number of characters Mafia. And now I also want it the other way around. So it's a bit strange to do this with regular expression. But that's how grab works. If you haven't heard about grab, it's not important. You can look it up afterwards. Just a command light tool to find all matches in a text file. And let's, uh, okay, this didn't work, probably because I did do it case sensitive and Pacino is usually written with it, yeah. And you see, it's actually quite fast, right? How long did it take? I mean, this was just two keywords, it took Okay, one twentieth of a one between one tenth and one twentieth of a second. And let's just look at the first at the movie titles. Okay, that's uh, and you already see interesting things happening. We have Godfather One. Oh, and for some reason I have an echo, but that's not by me, right? Does somebody? Mm -hmm. So where's Godfather 2 and 3? Why do we have an echo now? Does anybody have an idea why we have an echo now? Did anybody do something? And if something changed, you have to ask yourself what changed in the last few minutes. The Dark Knight goated movie, true and real. Yeah, so where's Godfather 2 and three, if you search for Mafia and uh, Pacino, you can figure that out. So it's not so bad, actually, just grab, right? That's a very simple approach. You just take your whole input and grab it. Grab takes around one gigabyte per second, and we just have a 50 megabyte uh, collection. So not a bad approach, just good to know, right? Just for uh, 
your curiosity, the current web has around 60 billion pages or maybe more. It's actually hard to know. The companies don't tell us. There's a website for this called World Wide Web Size. Actually, it estimates the web sizes using an interesting approach based on Zipf's law, which we will actually talk about in this lecture. So basically what they do, <laughs> I can briefly say it because it's interesting. Let's just do something like this. The so now I'm searching for the word the, and Google actually tells me so many documents contain the word the, 25 billion. And I can approximate from, and that has something to do with Zip's law, how frequent is the in documents usually. And knowing how frequent it is usually and how many documents uh, Google tells me it has with that word, tells me something about the size of their index. So that's the idea. So it's just an estimate, but a good one, I think. So we don't do it the grab way. We want to do it in a way that also works for bigger selections or when you don't have grab. And the standard way to do it is the inverted index. The inverted index is a very simple data structure. So what you pre-compute, it's something you pre-compute from your data and we will program it in a very simple version in a second for each word that occurs at least once, for example, Pacino, and you lowercase the word, you normalize them. The list of document IDs, so every document gets a number, just the line numbers, for example, Pacino occurs in document number 13, 57, 61, and you make sure that this is sorted. Same for every other word. Mafia occurs in the document 5, 23, 57. And now you can already see how that helps with answering keyword queries. If I want to know in which documents, which means lines in my file, which means movie descriptions, do I have both Pacino and Mafia? Well, I just look at this list. Where do I have the same ID? 57 has both of them, so 57 is a match. So I can compute it from these lists without actually going to the text once I have this just from these lists of numbers. And that's also how every search engine like Google will do it in principle. Of course, a lot of advanced stuff on top of that, but that's always the basic principle. It's the basic data structure and everybody should know it. And we will later see in the second half of the lecture that it also ha is strongly related to linear algebra and matrices in a not super magical way, but interesting way. So these things are called inverted lists. Maybe let me very briefly explain you why are they called inverted lists. They're called inverted lists because if you look at the, I mean, it's a strange name, right? If you look at this, what do you have? And let's even look, let, let's look at it with line numbers. So now I have for document one, the words in the document. That's kind of the, my data is just this information about movies. And here I have this data in a particular order. For each document, the words in that document. And here I have for each word, the document it contains. So in this sense, it's inverted. And I, yeah, we tried to figure this out before. It went away in the first I don't think it's the hair, but if I, it's too far away. So you are seeing me, if you see a reason why, when this happens, just uh, as a background process, try to figure out what's the reason for this sound effect. And it shouldn't be too far away because then it's too. So that's why they're called inverted lists. And important, that's different how I would do it today when we code it live. For the exercise sheet, each inverted list should contain a particular ID only once. So even if Pacino is mentioned three times in the document, maybe 57, 57 should be here only once. It's a tiny complication or you have to pay attention to it and it's easy to do something wrong there. So pay attention. It's easy to fix, but you have to take care of it. 
Alternative, uh, you could also do the following. Instead of having just a document ID, you could have a pair document ID and saying how many times is it there. That's actually related to lecture two. Not just saying it's in there, but also saying how often is it in there. What could it be? It's a bit annoying, right? But what could it be? Maybe it's also the cable. Hmm. Okay. Maybe I should just shouldn't move or not talk. That's also a solution. So how query processing one keyword? Maybe it's also my brain. If your query consists of only a single keyword, with what we have just pre-computed, you just want Pacino, well, there you have the result. Right, you have pre-computed it. So if you have pre-computed this and somebody types Pacino and wants three documents, you just say 135761. You can do it in zero time. It's already there. And to say this again, this is already ordered by popularity, so the higher line numbers are kind of the more popular movies, so these are even the most popular Pacino movies, if you give the numbers in the order in which you saw them in the file, which we will do. It's the natural way to do. How do you do it for two keywords? Well, here's a simple algorithm. <coughs> you have to implement it. Uh, it's called zipper for reasons that will be clear in a second. So here is, so that's our, let me just, uh, yeah, let me just call this list here L1. So now I have uh, two sorted lists of integers. It's important that they are sorted, otherwise this algorithm will not be efficient. And now let, let's just do the, uh, let me just check, yeah. So the zipper algorithm, and now I'm explaining an algorithm to you, a very simple algorithm, but it's actually very important in practice. So what you will have, you will have a variable i here for the first list and a variable j for the second list, which are both set to zero at the beginning of the list, at the beginning. And I think uh, I will just, I will just write this on top here. So this is my i and this is my variable j. So initially, let me just write it here. Initially, i and j are zero. And now you just look at i and j and you compare them. And if they are uh, equal, then you write that result, uh, write that ID to the result, because now I want to find the intersection. So I want to find documents which contain both words. And if, if they are not equal, you just advance. So now I just advance here. I have 57. Uh, no, no, that's not correct what I did here. I explained. I made a mistake. You don't advance in both lists. I missed the most important piece in this algorithm. The most important piece is that you advance in the list with a smaller number. So where you have the five, you advance. So advance, let me just write it here. Advance in the list with a smaller ID. That's the whole algorithm, and you can uh, think about why it's uh, correct. So now I'm here at 23. Now I compare 13 to 23. It's not equal. I don't write anything to the result. I advance in the list with a smaller value, which is now 13. Now I'm here. My i is here. My j is here. 57, 23. They are not equal. I advance in the list with a smaller id, which is here. 57. Now they are equal. I write 57 to my result. Now I can advance in both lists here. 61, 63, they are not equal. 61 is smaller. I advance in this list. 114, 63, not equal. I don't write anything to the result. 63 is smaller. I advance in this list. Now I have two equals again and I advance in both lists and so on. Maybe I have more common elements. 
the lists are longer here. That's the algorithm and it's called zipper, so like the zipper on your clothing because you go through these lists like this. Not necessarily in a strictly interleaving fashion, it really depends on the values here. You always compare where you are currently at and then you advance in the list with a smaller value. And because this is correct, think about it yourself because both lists are sorted, otherwise it would not be correct. And this you should implement, we will not implement it today, that's your task for the exercise sheet. And yes, the question in the chat, this is a, so a merge join. We will come to databases in lecture 3, and this is exactly sorted list intersection is what in the database world, you may not understand what it means now, but let me just say it, it's a merge join. When you join two tables on a, on a column they have in common and these columns are sorted, that's the same thing. And actually here we did intersection, that means we are only interested in those IDs which occur in both lists. Maybe we want all IDs, also if from both lists in sorted order, that's called merging. So then we would like as a result five 13, 23, 57, 57, 61, 63, so the whole, the union of the two in sorted order, that's why we, we will do in the next exercise sheet. Because maybe you also want documents which contain only one of the words. For the exercise sheet, you should actually do, be able to process more then two, so this is the, the intersection algorithm for two lists. Now what do you do if you have three, four, five lists? Well, for the exercise sheet you can make your life very simple, you just do it pairwise. So if you have lists L1 through LK, you just start with the first two, you intersect them, and then you intersect that result with the third one and so on. So you just have to implement the two, intersect two lists and just <laughs> use it iteratively to intersect K lists. There are more intelligent ways to do this. You don't need to implement them, but maybe you want to implement them. They are not so complicated for those of you who are a bit more experienced or just like the challenge. One thing is, if you think about it, I mean for the final result, you can intersect them for this pairwise heuristic, you can intersect them in any order it makes sense to start with the shorter ones, so just order the lists. Why? Well, if you have the shorter ones here, then this L12 will already be very short, right? So the lists, the result becomes small early on. You just spend less work if you start with the smaller ones. So that's an easy optimization, you don't have to implement it. And the other more important optimization is this very same algorithm here, you can generalize it to K lists. So just imagine I have three lists here. Now I have three pointers, A, I, J, and K, and you do the exact same thing, and you always advance in the list with the smallest value. But now you always have three values where you look at, or if you have K lists, K values, and you need a priority queue for that. So if you are interested in this stuff, look it up, or maybe you figure it out yourself. You are welcome to program it, you don't have to for the sheet. You can just do the simple pairwise iterate. The running time, by the way, of the k-way is log k times total length of the list. We maybe come back to this in a later lecture, maybe not. So, before we go to the coding, you somehow have to break the text into words. That's actually a problem that's harder than it seems. We can do something very simple, just take, uh, we will see it in the code in a second, just take longest sequences of word characters. So we just take the regular characters until we meet a character which is not a word character, like here is space. So we just break this up like the matrix is a uh, you will see it in a second, we will use a regular expression. So it's conceptually simple and yeah, we will just take the very basic, so if you have some funny character in there, it will be considered as breaking the words and the search for that character will not work. 
but it's it's good enough for exercise sheet one. Yeah, here's some. That's how reality looks like, and it's actually very important. And later we have a lecture about this because whatever you do, we have seen several examples: search engines, databases, and also programs like ChatGPT. It's super important that you can support all the languages and all the characters and and stuff like this. This is a haiku, by the way. Anybody here can read it? Please tell us. I actually know what it means. It's about monkeys and rain and winter, as you can see. In German, you have these words, Semester Eröffnungsparty Organisationskomitee, Vorsitzende. Some other languages also do this. They just fuse nouns into, so should this really be only one word? What if I search for party? Maybe I also want to find this. <coughs> and then you have funny characters. And if you do something wrong, the funny characters become other funny characters and you don't. So this actually, O Umlaut, Österreichisch, Gemüse, Brühe. And this is a very important topic and we have a part of a lecture about it, about this, getting this right. And actually one very small side story, when Google became big, in 2000, around the 2000s, and it was, there were other search engines before. One of the reasons they became so successful is because they did these stupid details right. This is so important in practice, I can't stress it enough. There were engines before, they just wouldn't work in Germany because they couldn't, they didn't deal properly with these characters like the German umlauts, O with two dots and these funny things. And now you have a whole country which is not using your engine because you didn't bother to care about their letters or language. And that was, yeah, so unbelievable, but, and Google just paid attention to this. And the official story is different, but actually that's a major reason for their success is that they took care of all the details. And encoding letters, that's a very important detail, which is why we have half a lecture about it. It's so important. How do we construct an inverted index? Well, I think we will go right to the coding now. Let's code together now. Let's build an inverted index from, uh, let's write some Python code now. Yeah, let's see, we have to keep this open, otherwise we will suffocate. Okay, let's start to write some code. And while I write the code, and you pay attention, so it's our joint responsibility that this code will be correct and compiles. So it's Python. It's a bit loud, right? Maybe let's try if it's, but if we close the door, so it's either suffocation or, let's try for a little more because the CO2 is, So the EU scene was an epoch in German history, right? Uh, 50 million years ago. That's when CO2 was three times. Maybe you don't understand what I say when I say EU scene. EU scene in German. 50 million years ago, the temperature was like 20 degrees higher and the CO2 in the atmosphere was like 1,200. Right now we have 2,200, so it's twice so in the EU scene, it was pretty hot. Jungles at the poles and so on. So, so let's see. We start with a, let's write some comment here. A simple inverted index as explained in lecture one. Okay, and now uh, let's start by Maybe I will explain some basic Python stuff on the side, but not everything. So this is now uh, the constructor, create an empty inverted index. So you always have to write this self things. So we have our inverted lists. And let me use types in Python. And let me just quickly go back to the slide think about it. Let me just go to the slide where I had it, to the right slide. This is what I want. 
For every word, I have a list of integers. So I have a dictionary where the key is the word and the value is a list of integers. Right? I have words and lists of integers. That's what I have. So let me write it like this. A dict, is this correct? And I have strings and I have lists of integers. So in Python you can And uh, initially that's empty. I have no words and uh, no words and the lists are empty. And probably I should put a... And just, if you see a mistake, if you spot it, just shout it out so that I can correct it. It's, our, it's your responsibility that it compiles without errors when we are done. Okay, that's the... Now we have an empty inverted index. Okay. And now we want... Uh, build it from a file and actually I've, I've shown you the file from the exercise sheet but let's look at, ah, I haven't copied this, let me just do this, uh, where do I, internal, internal, we have an example file, I think, yeah that's also linked on the wiki, right? but it's, uh, it's not here. Is it already in public or how do I get the example file? Maybe I should just download it. Is it on the wiki, Sebastian? It's in public templates, okay. Oh, it was here? Oh, it was here. Ah, I think I have to, yeah, just give me a second. I think I have to update. Yup. That's the stuff which you get to do the exercise sheet. I will explain it in a second. Okay, let me just copy it here. It will be linked on the wiki. Example, sheet one, example, TSV. Okay, now I should have it. Just ignore the last minute, just remove it from your memory. It served no purpose, <laughs> instructive purpose. So we have this input file, it's just a test file. We will always have uh, unit tests in our code so that you can check that you did things correctly. And you should note that this is of the same structure as this real file, the big one. But big file is not good for testing. So you have a title, and the title here is just doc1, doc2, doc3. You have a description of a movie, a movie, movie, a film, movie, stupid descriptions. And then, by the way, this is for future exercise sheets, there's also more information here. These things here in the middle, it's actually not spaces, it's a tab character. So if I go here with GA and NVIM, that's a uh, 0, 9, so that's a tab, it's not spaces, so it's tab separated. And this is, I think, the number of votes from IMDb. This is the IMDb score, at least in the real file, and this is the number of Wikipedia or Wikimedia articles about the movie. And these are just, if you want to play around with ranking, it's for lecture two. For this lecture, you can ignore it, you can also use it. So we want to build from a file, and let's see, you have to help me because my Python might be a little uh, rusty. So build inverted index from given file. Okay, so what do we do? We have to read the file, I guess, right? So let's, uh, with uh, open file name, as file. Okay, what do we do? We open the file, now we iterate over four line, we iterate over all lines. Now we have a line, now let's split it, split it by tabulators. Let's see, how do we split it? The first thing is the title, then comes the description, the rest we don't care about. I think that's the way to say in Python, don't care about. We want to split it by 
<coughs> tabulators and yeah, we only care about the first two columns, the rest we don't have to split it up. I think this will say split by tabulator but into at most three things. This will be the first column, the title, until the first tab, Shawshank Redemption, this will be the description, the long thing, and then the rest will be in this, this is just Python's way of saying don't care, some temporary variable. Okay. <coughs> now, what do I do? I Let's uh, split up the line in words, and I think we need the regex module from Python, let's just see, and you tell me when something, and I think we, is it find all, if I want all matches for, uh, so okay, we said these are our word characters, A to Z, plus, so this is a regular expression that matches a maximum sequence of these characters, so it would match matrix, it would match the, and so on. Plus says, if I would write star, it would, could also be no match. Plus says one or more. Okay, and uh, I think if I'm... You have to tell me if something is wrong. This should find just all matches of this regular expression, which means it should find all the words in a line and return them here. Okay, and let me just move this up. Oh, and before I continue, maybe let's write a unit test. We will often give you unit tests, so doc tests in Python. You can write the test right in the comment. So let's just see, what do we want? If I create an inverted index, so I just start with these three uh, f uh, greater than signs, which just says, okay, now comes code for a doc test. So just execute this code and see if the result is as it should be. You will see it in a second. So I'm just calling this build from file and now I'm taking the example TSV there. So let's just see if I build an inverted index from, from this example file. Now think about it. And now I want the inverted lists now the problem is that the inverted lists are a dictionary and the order of the words in the dictionary that's not defined in Python. So let me somehow, let me just take the key value pairs. I think you do that with Python. Hello. And then uh, let's sort that. That will be sorted by words now. Now I get pairs of word inverted list for that word. And now, without these three characters in the beginning, I can write down the... So what's the lexicographically smallest word in these movie descriptions? And let's just take the descriptions. We don't index the title for this code. What's the... If you see these three movie descriptions, it's just the second column. What's the lexicographically smallest word? Hmm? Movie, film? If I lowercase, we will lowercase the stuff. A. a, I think, A. Okay, so the first invert is the, let's try it like this, in which document, so if I give the documents IDs which correspond to the line numbers, in which documents does A occur? What? One and two, okay, so this should be the inverted list for this is what I expect. So I have a list for A and it should be the documents one and two. What's the lexicographically next one of the words that occurs? Film. film. I also think so. And film has which inverted list? Two. Yeah, okay. So this is how you write a unit test. Not you write the code and then you take the output from the code and paste it here, but you write what you expect there first. So the, there's only un one other word, which is movie. And now I will do what you will not do in the exercise sheet. When a word occurs multiple times in the document, I will have the document ID multiple times. That's what you should not do. In the exercise sheet, there should only be one one. But I will do it like this now for simplicity. 
so that you also have something to think about for the exercise sheet. So one one movie occurs in document one again in document one. Yeah, and let's just see. And the reason I did the sorted here is because yeah, a dictionary. It's it's not clear in which the in which it stores the order. So. So what do I do now? So let's uh, so for each word for word in words. Okay, first I think I need now the record ID. So let's start with uh, somehow I need to keep track of where I am, the line number, and let's just whenever I read a file increase this. And let's just go up here again. So yeah, so I'm reading the first line and now my record ID is one. So now I have a word and I'm a record one. So what I do I do? <coughs> well, I take the inverted list of this word. So I've already seen this word and now I can I can just append the record ID. I think that's what I need, right? And the nice thing is because I'm going through the documents in order anyway, so I, for example, I'm here, I'm at the dark, and now I just, I'm in document 12, maybe I've already seen dark before, now I just go through the, to the inverted list of uh, dark and append 12, this line number, this record ID. And that's how I built the list for and maybe I uh, should lowercase my word here, yeah, so that I lowercase this. Any questions about this? I think that's almost it, but not quite. Any questions about this line, this code? Will it work? Will it not work? Probably not. Okay, there's a probabilistic statement about this code. Interesting. Our world universe is also probabilistic, so it fits in that respect. Why probably? Okay, what are you not sure about? Okay, you, you doubt about this. I think, I, I'm also not sure, but I think you can. That's Python. In Java, you would have to write 20 lines. In Python, it's one line. Okay, and the list may be not initialized. The lists are not initialized. Yeah, that's true, I think. Initially, we don't have any lists, right? It's just empty. And now, I, when I see a word for the first time, this will probably not work, right? Here I'm saying, give me the list for that word. No, I don't think that we, we should absolutely. Let me do it this way, word lower. And uh, so if the word is not in that inverted list, we add it to that inverted. We should first create this list for the first time. I think you are absolutely right. So I should create this list for them. So if I'm seeing this word for the first time, yeah, if uh, we see the word for the first time, create empty list. Okay, and now here we do append record ID to the list. And just note, that's very nice, it's automatically sorted because we are going through the record IDs in ascending order that way, right? So I append something automatically, it will be no smaller than the stuff. So we have something in this chat. Shouldn't the line in find all be re replaced with desk since we only want to search the descriptions? I completely agree. It should be desk here. Okay. And you should also code like that, not just mindless coding and then compiling until you have no more syntax errors. The goal should be that your code compiles on the first try. So will this compile and will it work? Any other? It's our one big achievement in this lecture, yes?
And if the word is repeated, but that's on purpose, we want that. I wrote it in the unit test. For the exercise sheet, you shouldn't do it. You should check. Here it's okay. So if it occurs twice, I have the same record ID twice. That's why I wrote it in the unit test. Yeah? Well, always say line number, please, so that I... Line 35. 35. Ah, so you are saying we are missing numbers. Yeah, that's true. We're missing... Okay, that's a fair comment, but for simplicity we are doing that way because it's not right now it's also written on the exercise sheet. But you're completely right. By this very simple regex we are missing like this year, 1977, we can't search it. That's true, it's absolutely true. And also I see one thing we should include, the no, we did include the regex thing. Okay, maybe just to look at it again, and I'm already starting. First thing, we just asked our style checker, inverted. Flake 8 just checks, do I write it in proper Python style? Wow, we did not make a single... That's um, pretty good. No st yeah, if I would uh, have two lines here, I would get some... Yeah, it says too many blank lines. It's actually quite picky. Okay, should we? Let's see. Now I will just execute the doc tests, which means it will just execute this code. It will just call the code, build an inverted index, use the example files, and check if this is correct. Wow. That's amazing. No check style error, and the test was right. Let's just check that it actually executed the test by making the test wrong. Okay, now it will say... Now I deliberately gave it a wrong test, so it said I expected this, 1, 3, which is wrong, it got this. So congratulations to you too, we did a no compilation error, no check style, the style was perfect, on the first go. The, so that's the goal for your... A, and don't write a lot of code at once, write small pieces and then it should just uh, compile, so that's... Uh, Okay, great. Now we are almost done. Uh, as, yeah, we are, as you can see. Yeah, let's code this together. Now one more thing. I, I promised that we would talk about Zipf's law. Let's look at the... Now that we have these lists, we can do one thing very easily. Let's just write a small main program here. So if I'm calling this as a main program, I think that's the way you do it in Python. Ah, now I should do... Oh, I have to... arc pass. Okay, I'm not sure whether I can do the argument parsing correctly. Arc pass. How do I... What do I write for arc pass? Arc pass... I'm not using... Who knows it? If I want to pass the command line arguments. I just want to call this like this now. Let me just clarify this without the doc tests. And I want to call it on my example file. And now I want to pass this command line argument. How do I do it? Hmm? Yeah, there's one argument. Pass the command line arguments, okay. Oh, I have to go here, okay. Oh, there it came. Oh, it just came magically. Okay, arc parser. I think I should uh, arc parser. Hmm, add arguments, okay, wow. File name. File name is good. Uh, and I think here I could also add uh, build an inverted index. Build an inverted index, add argument file name, uh, file to build index from. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. 
And now I have to parse it somehow, right? How do I parse it? Nobody knows here how uh, arc? Ah, yeah, there it is. Okay, thank you. Okay, now I have it. And now I want to call my inverted index. Inverted index. Now I want to uh, build it from uh, this file. How do I get it? Arcs file name. And again. And now I just want to output the f how frequent each word occurs. That's what SIF's law is about. So I just go to for word in I I. It's getting loud again. Inverted lists. And now I want print in a format. It's I want to print the word. A tabulator and uh, and the length of the inverted list. Len of I I inverted the inverted list of that word. Let's see if it works. No, it's not print F in Python. Is this correct? So this just passing the will it our goal is to compile it on the first pass? No, you can't use numbers. It's not correct? You can't use complex I can't use complex impre I think I can. I think I can. I'm pretty sure about that one. Do you see another problem? Let's see. It's again, it just worked. Let's see if I don't have the argument here. It will tell me, okay, I can write. So we are really good. We are really good. Wow. So now I have the inverted. So it tells me A in this example is uh, twice, movie three times, one, two, three, film once. Okay. And now the nice thing in computer science is if you have written a program that works for an example file, then it also works for the big file, right? It's not that you have to write a new program for it to run on a 50 megabyte file. I don't you have, know if you have ever realized this, but that's the nice thing about computer science. <laughs> just, then you can just run it on one million files. Now it will just, yeah, and it will output this. And now let's do the following. Let's uh, let's just uh, sort this by the second column, and now we will get the word frequencies. Most frequent word first. What will be the most frequent? What will be the top three most frequent words in our collection? I'm looking for the apostrophe, and I don't find it. Ah, there it is. This is tab separated. This is why I'm doing this minus k n two two n r. This is sorting in reverse order. Just taking the output and sorting by the second column in reverse order. What will be the most frequent word? What? The? C. Yeah, the and film film. Who would have thought? Film, it's the third most. So these are the word frequencies in this collection. And now let's do one final thing. We are almost done. Party. Let's just write this into a file. Word frequencies. Dot TSV. Will take a while. So it's actually big files already. Okay, now I have it in a file. Word frequencies. And now let's just plot these numbers here, these frequencies. One, two, three. The first most frequent one, the second most frequent one. Let's do this with a GNU plot. So let's say plot. Let's just plot this. I can just give it this file. Frequencies dot tsv. I only want the second column. That's, I think, how I do it. And this is pause minus one is so that the window doesn't disappear again right away. And I think it should be uh, this one. Ah, 
Okay, that is, uh, let's just plot the initial part. The first, maybe the first hundred most frequent. Okay, there we have it. This says the most frequent word occurs like, that's the number we have seen, 300,000 times, the second most frequent one, the third most frequent one. So what you see here is just the frequencies ordered by how frequent. That's why it goes down. But not only does it go down, it goes down in this very nice way. And that was just movie descriptions. And that's Zipf's law. Zipf's law just said, take whatever you like and you just look at this frequency distribution and it always looks like this. And the question is, what's, what's like this? That's what Zipf observed. And it's kind of easy to observe nowadays, but like in his time, which was, uh, yeah, 100 years ago, that was a bit harder to observe because you didn't have computer programs. And actually, it's this function. It's like a hyperbola where you have this. Uh, and how can you check? That's the last thing I want to do today. How can you check that it's actually that function? Let's do that here. So if, uh, let's say Fn is uh, C times N to the minus alpha. So that's Zipf's law. Zipf's law says it follows somehow this law where we have some constants here. Proportional means there is some constant. And then it's n, so n is 1 for the most frequent one, f2 is the second most frequent one, f3 is the third most frequent one, and we have some parameter alpha here. Let's just take the logarithm on both sides. Log fn is equal to, and if I take the logarithm here, it's log c plus log of n to the minus alpha, which is minus alpha type log n. Which means, if I don't plot fn over n, but log fn over log n, what should I see? It's a log log plot, so I'm not plotting the numbers, so what, what we saw in the plot was fn on the y-axis, n on the x-axis. And now if we put log n on the x-axis and log fn, you said it? A line. a line, you said a line. Yes, we should see a line, right? Is it a f which line, which slope? What? Down. down. Yeah, down, because it's minus alpha. And we can even read off the values from the line, right? The slope will be the alpha, the negative slope, and the c here this hidden constant, it's already, it's also written here. Let's just do that. Frank, we are almost finished. In GNU plot, you don't need it for the exercise sheet, but it's just good to set. I can just say plot this in a log scale, which means on the x and y axis take the logarithm, both axes. Yeah. And then now I only took the first Let's take all of them, not just the first. Yeah. So that's Zipf's law. So it's, it's not a perfect line, but it's pretty line-ish. So that kind of proves, in the end, you have some funny artifacts. You can think about why. It kind of proves that that's the law. And the nice thing about this law, and you can put in anything there, any text, but also other things, where you just count frequencies. And it always looks like this. It's kind of a Gaussian, this normal distribution. You, you see it everywhere. You take anything in nature, you always get this distribution. OK, so that's uh, this part I will skip. This is about how, uh, how you submit stuff. Sebastian, by the way, let me introduce Sebastian. Can you very briefly stand up, please, Sebastian? So that's Sebastian, thank you. Uh, he's the uh, assistant for this course. So he will do a lot of very, thank you, very valuable work behind the scenes. And he will, 
he promised, which I think is great, record a short video where you will just show and explain how these course systems work, how you submit to our versioning system, how you register, just the, the whole thing which you need to do for exercise sheet one. So there is a forum. Let me at least show it to you once. Uh, it looks like this here. So that's our system, so that you have seen it uh, once. Once. Okay, I'm registering here. I'm already registered. Uh huh. Ah, okay, I don't know what's going wrong here. You just have to, so there's a forum where you can ask questions. Here's Sebastian's name again. There is this uh, repository, it will be in the video, how you use it. The slides are just for reference. That's what I just said, Sebastian will record a video. Whenever you submit something, the code will be automatically checked. It's called uh, continuous integration. You also have it on GitHub. We have our own system. You submit something, it will be checked for compile errors, tests run through, and so on. And that's it. Here's some references. As I said, you don't really need them, just if you are interested. That's it. The exercise sheet is uh, on the wiki. Are there any more questions right now or in the chat, which I didn't see? So, to, yes, please. Ah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking this. Actually, I should have, at the top of the exercise sheet, you have a, one more minute, please. There will be two lectures, two weeks where we have no lecture, so the overtime is okay. That's why we're doing this. Here's in red these rules. You should absolutely read them. It's on the exercise sheet. You must read them. And the first one is about the programming language. So we exclusively use Python. We used to allow other programming languages, but really it's much more work and nobody really does it. So in this semester, we just say everybody used Python. In the past, maybe one person. If you absolutely, for a very good reason, want to use another programming language, talk to us, might be okay but m most people want to use that anyway. And also it's version 3.10 or newer for a reason which I skipped now, but we will communicate it afterwards. It just lists, just read this through carefully. It's also written on the sheet. Any other question right now? Okay, so that's it uh, for today. Have fun with the first sheet and see you next week. Bye-bye.